Um, most famous, most famous Jewish person. Can anybody name anybody who's Jewish? Can you name anybody who's Jewish? Jeff Goldberg. Jeff Goldberg. Billy Crystal. Billy Crystal. Oh, you're going to talk about actors. The most famous Jewish person. <laughs> Yeah. How about the most famous Jewish person in history? In history? Yeah. <laughs> Einstein? Einstein was Jewish? Was he? Yeah. Almost all your psychologists are Jewish. Boy. But we're not, I'm not, I'm cheating. So who, who else? Do we know of anybody who's Jewish? JC? Jesus Christ? Yeah, he's Jewish. Anybody else? Have you ever heard of Anne Frank? William the Writer. Yeah. And the Holocaust of time. No, Holocaust victim. victim. Yeah, she died in Auschwitz in 1945. So that was her diary that was written? The diary of Anne Frank, yeah. She was, uh, she was trying to uh, stay away from the Nazis. Uh, she's some, Dutch. I'm somebody sorry. tried to hide her. They did. They 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 hid her, uh, her and her family for two years. They hid them for two years, so she was successfully hidden for two years. Very famous individual, Jesus Christ, of course. Oh, you you looked it up on your computer. No, no, I was like looking on the web page. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld. Okay, wait a minute. We're doing. We're, we're <laughs> uh, something really interesting has happened over the last three days. Uh, evidently, people have stopped caring about kids, school kids, and they keep hitting them with cars. I know. It's happened five times uh, in the last three days. It's happened in Florida, Mississippi, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and one other place that I'm not exactly sure where it was. Some of these kids were killed. Um, a uh, sister and two brothers were, were killed. She tried to, she tried to, uh, to shield the two boys. Uh, but all three of them were killed. And this was in Pennsylvania. Um, is, does it have anything to do with race? No, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with race. But it does seem to have to do with people that are in such a hurry that they don't, they're not even looking. They're zipping through residential areas. And it's happened five times in the last three days, sh as shocking as that is. Um, the other thing that uh, I was re reading an article in... Uh, the Smithsonian Magazine, and they were talking about, uh, I was talking to Francis about this earlier. Uh, the, it was about Anne Frank and how, how famous and popular she is. She's the most popular, her, uh, the house where she hid uh, is the uh, most popular attraction in, in the Netherlands. Uh, they have over a million visitors a year. You have to make an appointment to go there. Uh, that's how popular it is. Now the funny thing is, and I don't know how, how humorous this is actually, but there's nothing Jewish at the place. Uh, they had a, an individual that was working there who put a yarmulke on, that little skull cap that, that Jewish males wear, uh, and he was told to cover it up with a baseball cap. He said he, they told him he could wear it, he just couldn't wear it out in public because there's so much antipathy toward Jewish people. <clears throat> the, uh, when they describe uh, Anne Frank, they don't talk about the fact that she was Jewish. As curious as that is, there's that much antipathy toward Jewish people. So the funny thing, and it's not that funny, I guess this is really kind of tragic if you think about it. I was reading the article, and the article said that people love dead Jews. And Frank is beloved all over the world. Uh, her book was uh, tr translated into 70 different languages. And she died in the Holocaust, of course. Uh, people love dead Jews, but they hate live Jews. It's just something that you might think about. It's in the, it's in the article, and that's the reason I'm mentioning it. Uh, I'm not mentioning it because I believe it. I think it's a it's a it's a god awful and horrible uh, idea. But uh, as isolated as we are here on the reservation, it's one of the things that you need to think about for the future. Um, because potentially you'll never come in contact with anybody that's Jewish. Potentially. But we may have Jewish uh, um, instructors at this institution. 
I don't know. I never, I never ask people what, what religion they are, or whether they celebrate Christmas or not. Uh, I found out last night there's a lot of people that don't celebrate Halloween, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, as I was driving to Gallup, there was a huge billboard that said, uh, don't celebrate Halloween. Uh, it has to do with, with human sacrifice. Has anybody seen that one? I know. Have you seen the buffalo? Right across the street is a buffalo. I know, it's out there. In, I think they're trying to breed beefaloes, you know. There's a bit of heifers out there. So, I don't know. Uh, so there are a lot of people, a lot of Christians that uh, be don't believe that you should uh, celebrate Halloween, and that's fine. Uh, if you're Catholic, of course, potentially today is the, the middle day of the Day of the Dead. Uh, the Day of the Dead is uh, the 31st of, of October, the 1st of November, and the 2nd of November. It has to do with uh, All Hallows' Eve, which is Halloween. Uh, it has to do with uh, today, which is uh, All Saints' Day. And tomorrow is All Souls Day. Uh, so as far as select Catholics are concerned, and not all Catholics celebrate the same way, uh, but as far as some Catholics are concerned, they celebrate <clears throat> the people that they lost that, that year, the people that they have lost since the last All Souls Day. Uh, so that's what the Day of the Dead is all about. Uh, so if you go down to Mexico, it's, it's a big party. Uh, it's a huge party down in Mexico or any place where they have a large Mexican population. How important is that? Is that important at all? It is? Okay. <laughs> I worry sometimes as to whether it's important or not. Uh, so this, uh, actually this chapter we're going to talk about morality. Uh, so I don't know how moral it is for people to appreciate uh, not appreciate Jewish people, but uh, as long as they're not al alive, I guess they do appreciate them. Uh, we all celebrate Einstein as the most brilliant man that has ever, ever lived, but of course he was Jewish, and he had to flee uh, from uh, Germany, and that's the reason he ended up in the United States, teaching at Princeton University, uh, because we were willing to give him sanctuary from the Nazis during World War II. And now he's no longer with us. <clears throat> uh, Stephen Hawking died uh, last month. Anybody? Okay. You guys know who Stephen Hawking was? Physicist? Uh, not a moralist. He was a physicist. And he's, uh, he tried to correct uh, some of Einstein's ideas. Or tried to expand on some of Einstein's ideas, actually. Uh, at the end of his life, he said, uh, there is no God. Stephen Hawking. I don't know what that has to do with morality, but probably it's anti-morality or something. I don't think he was the Antichrist. Okay, so we're going to talk about, we talked about ethnocentrism and how ugly uh, ethnocentrism is. Um, I am editing a uh, paper that was written by the guys next door. Uh, who are those guys? Anyway, I'm, I'm editing it. It's really kind of fascinating to read. Uh, because it talks about uh, Navajo government and the fact that Navajo government has been around forever uh, and then in 1850 was the last time they ever they ever met as a group this Navajo government structure Nachi or something I can't I can't pronounce it correctly so I won't even <laughs> pretend to do that anyway it's a, it's a uh, it was a form of government uh, it hasn't met since. Uh, the idea was uh, 12 war chiefs, 12 peace chiefs come together and they have a big ceremony uh, and they make decisions about what's going to happen next. Uh, kind of curious. But of course they blame the fact that it hasn't met on the American government, despite the fact that it stopped in 1850. What was going on in 1850? Not a whole lot. I guess. The long walk was in 1864, but the last time this, this group met was in 1850. Couldn't quite figure that one out, but I'll, I'll figure it out eventually. In uh, 1971, Lawrence Colbert developed his stages of moral development. Uh, there are three stages. They have a brilliant, he decided to give them brilliant names. He, and so he called stage one <laughs> pre-conventional morality. Uh, he called uh, stage two conventional morality and stage three post-conventional morality. There's, that's going to be difficult to remember. 
pre-conventional, pre -con conventional, and post-conventional morality. Pre-conventional morality is where you're uh, selfish. Uh, so you do things because it benefits you. That's pre-conventional morality. <clears throat> Pre-conventional morality. And this was, uh, Col Colbert came up with this in the 1960s. And of course, in the 1960s, we had civil rights were exploding. Uh, the the uh, war uh, started in 1963. Uh, so we had anti-war movements going on in the United States. So he came up with this morality uh, in a, a time of chaos in the United States. There was a lot of upheaval going on. Uh, the Watts, uh, the, the Watts, Riots were in 1960, not 1965. So there's a lot of stuff going on. From 1965 until 1970, almost all the cities in the United States exploded in riot. Uh, African Americans were rioting in the streets. Um, Cincinnati, Detroit, uh, Newark, uh, not New York, uh, strangely enough. Uh, <coughs> Every place except in the South. Now, why in the world wouldn't African Americans uh, riot in the South? There were no riots in Baton Rouge, no riots in New Orleans, no riots in uh, Atlanta. So what's going on? In this? Why in the world would they riot in the North? It was better in the North. They were being treated better in the North. What, so why didn't they riot in the South, where they were actually being treated really poorly, to the extent that they couldn't even vote? They wouldn't even let them vote. So why weren't they rioting in the South? I guess that will be the origin of um, uh, African all, all rights. Of, uh, uh, anybody that's a shade of black or brown, I would think. Well, that's where I'd riot, where they were treating me the worst. Yeah. Wouldn't you? It never happened. Why not? I would say that probably it was it was it was probably just too too violent. Too think. dangerous. It was too dangerous. If you rioted in Atlanta, they killed you. If you rioted in Newark, you probably survived. Or in Detroit, or in Cincinnati, you probably survived. Because the whites in the South were real serious about not letting you do anything that you wanted to do. You had to ride in the back of the bus. I mean, it's even like uh, you can see pictures. I think you can uh, you actually find pictures where people are hanging. Lynchings, exactly. Where almost all the lynchings were in the South. Not all of them, but most of them were. Almost all of them were in the South. So if you rioted in Atlanta, Georgia, you might end up from the end of a rope someplace. I know lynchings. Didn't happen in the north. Didn't happen nearly as much in the north. Anyway, so we have pre-conventional uh, uh, morality that has to do with uh, with selfishness. If it benefits me, then that's my morality. That's pre-conventional. Conventional morality is uh, where you maintain the social order. So if it's good for the society, that's that's what conventional uh, morality is. You'll do something for. Uh, for the rest of the, of the people in your in your, in your uh, society, that's conventional. So pre-conventional is indivi very individualistic, very narcissistic, and conventional has to do with trying to support society uh, with through your morality. <clears throat> this level dicta dictates that morality is about following the rules, and individuals should not question where those rules come from. And of course, that's what we do here. We try not to get, uh, question anybody's rules. Post-conventional, that's number three. Post-conventional morality has to do with principles of right and wrong. It has actually to do with moral decisions that you have to make. So it doesn't have to do with society. It doesn't have to do with the individual. It has to do with what is actually transcendentally a right and wrong. Good behavior is seen as that which is consistent with a set of universal ethical principles that emphasize justice and individual rights. So we always do what is correct because we have a moral obligation to do what is correct. Now, strangely enough, Colbert went around the world trying to determine if uh, different uh, areas, uh, different nations, uh, maintain uh, pre-conventional, conventional, or post-conventional morality. That's what he was trying to determine. 
Uh, remember, this is in the 1960s. In 1968, there was a huge revolution all over the world. People were rebelling all over the place. Uh, social democracy was trying to take over uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so there were rioting, there was rioting in the streets in Paris. There was rioting in the streets in, in London. Uh, so this is something that happened uh, all over the world. It happened in Germany. Of course, Germany was split at this time. It was uh, in, in East and West Germany. So there was all kinds of stuff going on all over the place in 1968. And this is when Kohlberg was wandering around the world trying to determine about morality all over the world. And of course, Vietnam was going on. Vietnam had been going on since 1963. 1968 was the year of the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive was, was the turning point in the war in Vietnam. Uh, the Viet Cong almost annihilated themselves by attacking uh, en masse uh, in uh, Vietnam. There were a lot of Americans that were killed. Now the interesting thing is uh, that uh, from 1963 until 1968, a select number of Americans were killed. Uh, from 1968 until 1975, when we pulled out of Vietnam, an equal number of Americans were killed, despite the fact that we were talking about uh, decreasing the number of, of ground troops we had in Vietnam. We still lost exactly as many men in uh, the second half of Vietnam as we did in the first half of Vietnam. Why is all this important? Well, this has to do with why Kohlberg <laughs> was trying to come up with his moral reasoning. Uh, Snary in 1985 did a meta-analysis of 27 cultural areas from around the world that had been tested using Kohlberg's parameters. There was some universality in moral reasoning. Uh, in all cultures, there were some adults who reasoned at the conventional levels, and in no cultural groups did the average adult reason at the pre-conventional level. In other words, I, a society couldn't exist in a, uh, at a pre-conventional level. Uh, they couldn't exist if, they, uh, if they were, uh, their morality had to do with, with uh, selfishness and uh, individuality. It didn't work. And there were no societies that they looked at, no matter how primitive they were, uh, where, they, where they actually used pre-conventional uh, morality. But in the United States, we saw a lot of post-conventional morality. Why is the war wrong? Well, the war, war was wrong because of this reason, this reason, and this reason. It had to do with justice. It didn't have to do with social order. If it had to do with social order, then nobody would have uh, demonstrated against the war in Vietnam because the, that's what the government was telling you to do. Evidence of post-conventional moral reasoning was not universally found. Moral reasoning based on justice and individual rights, we couldn't find that anywhere, no matter what type of uh, morality they used. Uh, so even if in a Buddhist country, a country where they followed uh, Buddhist precepts, uh, those, they had conventional uh, morality just like everybody else did. Just because they had more monks wandering through the streets didn't mean that they had uh, post-conventional morality. Every urban western sample contained at least some individuals who showed reasoning based on justice and individual rights. Uh, so where were these guys? Well, most of these guys were in, in, uh, on college campuses. Uh, the individuals that uh, were preaching justice and individual rights. Uh, and this was one of the reasons why if you uh, discuss uh, education with somebody on the far right, uh, they'll tell you that education uh, ruins you because it's all liberal. Why is it liberal? Because it teaches, uh, teaches you about justice and individual rights, which is too progressive for some people. They want everybody to follow the rules. They want to make the rules and then everybody has to follow the rules. <coughs> so we've got a question coming up right now. This, is happening, this just happened a couple days ago. Uh, President Trump uh, declared that he could uh, do away with the 14th Admi Amendment. And the 14th Amendment has to do with if you are born in the United States, then you are a citizen of the United States. This law, was, this amendment was written in 19, 19, uh, 1866, after the Civil War. The question was, we have all these African Americans who were not citizens of the United States. We have all these people that were born in Africa who were not citizens of the United States. 
And now that the war is over, now that the Civil War has been won by the North, the question is, are these people citizens of the United States? That was the question. And so they, they came up with this, this, the uh, 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment says, if you are born in the United States, then you are a citizen of the United States, no matter who your parents were. And the reason they wrote the law was because the individuals that gave birth to this individual that was born in the United States potentially were not from the United States. So what are you going to do with these guys? Make them non-citizens? Kick them out of the country? Repatriate them to wherever they came from? Well, usually you didn't know where they came from, or, and most people didn't care where they came from. So that's the reason that the 14th Amendment was written. And it had to do with, didn't have as much to do with immigration as it had to do with that group of individuals who had no status prior to the Civil War. And then after the Civil War, of course, now we had to do something with all of, with these millions of, of uh, people of African descent. So he claimed that he, he claimed that he could change that by, by executive order or executive fiat. And so it's a constitutional crisis, or a constitutional crisis has come up. So the idea is, can he do it or can't he do it, is the question. And the answer seems to be that he can't, since it's a, an amendment to the Constitution. And he would have to change the Constitution in order to change this law. <clears throat> but he says that he can change the interpretation of that law. which is kind of interesting. Now this is making the people on the, on the far right, they're just, they're, they're, they're dancing in the street about this. Great idea, it, we're, going to, we're, uh, we're going to keep all of these immigrants out of the United States. Just because you made a baby here doesn't mean that that baby is a, a, a citizen of the United States. Really kind of fascinating. Not a single person from the traditional tribal and uh, village folk uh, populations showed such reasoning, uh, the, the uh, post-conventional reasoning, the individual and justice reasoning. But there's a reason for that. They live in a society that is um, far more difficult. They're, they're living uh, uh, survival tactics. They're living in a world where survival is not, is not guaranteed. One reason for the discrepancy between traditional societies and more urbane uh, Western societies may be because of the educational experiences of both societies. And of course, this is one of the things that uh, the religious right has told you. Uh, that They have told you that uh, too much education can ruin the way that you think. That you're learning too many liberal ideas. I don't know, are you le learning too many liberal ideas? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if the liberal ideas are incorrect, just reject them, okay? <laughs> oh, they told me about this when I was in college, and I thought it was a pile of crap, so I'll just um, I can't believe it. That's what you should say. Uh, we should be teaching you to, to uh, be able to discern for yourself what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad. I hope that's what we're teaching you, or trying to anyway. Or maybe we're not. Maybe we're trying to preach to you and get you to believe every damn thing that we say. Is that, are we doing, is it working? Is it working? No, it's not working. Okay, good. <laughs> I hope you've got brains of your own that you don't just accept everything that we say. You need to analyze things. You need to be open-minded and analyze things. Uh, I, you know, I can talk about voting all year long, but you're, going, you're the ones that are going to be listening to the advertisements for McSally and, and Cinema and deciding who you're going to vote for. And you've got to vote. And I don't care who you vote for, but you've got to vote. Otherwise, they're going to ignore you guys. And they will. The Republicans want to forget that you guys exist. There are people that want to do away with all the treaties and pretend that you guys don't exist, and close down the reservations. These people do exist, and they're out there. So you got to vote. Otherwise, they, they will ignore you and pretend that you don't exist. And if you don't vote, then they can ignore you. 
because you don't exist as far as they're concerned. So you got to vote. Is everybody going to vote? Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Even if you have to travel to Lukachukai or whatever, wherever you go. <laughs> should we not vote for? You can vote for anybody you want as long as you vote. I, as long as they they look at your name and go, oh, I, that, they live on the reservation. They must be Navajo. I already voted. I voted in Iowa, of course. I'm not a Navajo anyway. It won't make any difference if I, if I vote. <laughs> They're not going to, well, they, they just know that I'm a white guy. <clears throat> a white male. Most dangerous person in the United States, obviously, since they seem to be shooting and killing people. In the old days, it was it was younger guys. Now it's people in their 50s and 60s. White guys in their 50s and 60s. Well, I'm almost too old for that. I'm almost beyond my killing, killing range, <laughs> killing age. <laughs> I'm right there at the at the edge of 70, so I'm okay. I can't re remember how to load a gun anyway. I don't remember. Them new guns, they're too hard to use. I remember when you just pushed the bullets in. <laughs> Where's the revolver? I don't know. This thing's just all square and you just put something in the bottom of it. I don't understand how you do that. When I was in the military, we just spun that thing around and put the bullets in. Traditional educational practices may not include so the same ideas of justice and individual rights. Uh, another explanation for the discrepancies between traditional and Western cultures is that the two types of cultures live in different environments. Because of the harsher environment, tribal and village populations have more concerns than justice and individual rights. They don't have time to think about these things. Only people with a lot of free time can think about justice and individual rights. If I'm working every day and I'm working a 12-hour day or a 14-hour day on my farm, uh, then I really don't have time to think about justice and individual rights. Uh, I may not be able, I, they have to give me a day off so I can go vote because I work so hard. And maybe I'll just take a nap that day and not go vote. It's possible. Okay, so Colbert came up with uh, pre-conventional, conventional, and uh, post-conventional morality. <clears throat> but, it, but people have come after him, and they've said, you know, uh, there's more to this than just those three types of morality. Schwader and his colleagues, and this is a picture of Schwader, in 1977 argued that Colbert's model of moral reasoning only represented one of the three codes that uh, people use for moral judgments around the world. Uh, Colbert. Uh, what's, what's important about Colbert? Well, Colbert was the first one to even try to, uh, to uh, program morality. And he was also Jewish. Is that important? Not really. Who cares whether, what religion he was? Schwager, on the other hand, was also Jewish. Is that important? Not really. We're talking about morality here. We're not really talking about religion. We're talking about morality. So Schwader and his colleagues, and, not, and, and the, there's a reason why Colbert and Schwader argued. Colbert was at Harvard. Schwader was not. Schwader was at Yale. Harvard and Yale like to argue with each other all the time. They play football against each other. They, they play hockey against each other. And the professors from Yale like to argue with the professors from Harvard. Anyway, so Schwader... Uh, and his colleagues came up with, uh, with, a, with a new explanation. He said that there, there are three types of ethics. The ethics of autonomy, the ethics of community, and the ethics of divinity. He said that uh, Kohlberg's model was an ethic of autonomy. Uh, Pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. He said that uh, that, that just <laughs> included one type of ethics. So the ethic views morality in, in terms of individual freedom and, and rights violations. An act is seen as immoral under the, eth the ethic of autonomy when it directly hurts another person or infringes, infringes on another's rights and freedoms as an individual. So as, as far as Schwader was concerned, he was only dealing with one aspect of, of ethics. He was only dealing with the ethic 
of autonomy. Uh, Kohlberg. The second code of ethics uh, that Schwader and, co and his colleagues proposed uh, is an ethic of community which emphasizes that individuals have duties that conform with their roles in a community or their social uh, hierarchy. Uh, so you have a position to be in as far as your, your society is concerned. Would you say that fits with the, the Navajo philosophy? The ethics of community. Yep. Yep. Okay, so you agree with Schwader, the Yale. You agree with the guy from Yale and said, <laughs> no, it's not that important. According to this code, there is an ethical uh, principle to uphold one's interpersonal duties and obligations toward others. Do we have obligations toward others? In the Navajo community, do you have, uh, do you have obligations to others? Yeah. Well, you do, but does everybody, does everybody on, the, on the reservation? Well, they have family values. Family values. You have to maintain the clan system. There are taboos that you're supposed to maintain, and that has to do with other individuals. Actions are seen as wrong when individuals fail to perform their duties. There you go. One of those duties is wearing black and gray clothes. Well, we're doing pretty well today. Not everybody has on black. <laughs> Some of us do, but the rest of us don't. Of course, I don't count. I'm not from here. <sighs> bugs the hell out of me when I go to Chinle and I almost run into somebody because they're wearing black clothes at night. <laughs> I told you about Margaret. She was walking around hold on housing and black clothes there. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret the Ninja was wandering around. <laughs> last night? It wasn't last night, no. it was a couple nights ago. I almost <laughs> hit her. Of course, she only weighs 36 pounds. I mean, <laughs> I probably would have broken, well, I probably would have broken her instead of my car. But my car is a little tiny thing. <laughs> <laughs> like a little kitty car. Did you give out candy last time? I did give out candy, but hardly anybody came. I was real upset. I had some, like, old people coming in and asking for candy. You know, they'd have a mark on their face and go, uh, trick or treat, you know. This guy with a beard and a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave him a whole fistful of candy. A third code that Schwader and colleagues suggested was an ethic of divinity, which is concerned with sanctity and the perceived natural order of things. There's a natural order of things. Does that fit in Navajo philosophy as well? There's a natural order of things? This code contains the ethical principle that one is obligated to preserve the standards man uh, mandated by a trend transcendent authority. And this transcendent authority, in your case, is the holy people. They've given you all of these dictates. They've, they've created this, this whole structure of, of how you're supposed to live. You're supposed to wake up in the morning and you're supposed to pray to the, the holy people. Isn't that the way it works? Yeah. Corn pollen is part of that. I'm not even going to pretend I have a clue what's going on. Okay. <laughs> I just know that it exists, all right? <clears throat> Actions are seen as immoral if they cause uh, impurity or degradation to oneself or others, or if one shows any disrespect for God or God's creations. And of course, that fits right in with everything that you guys believe, right? I have a question. Um, Uh-oh. I was, I was reading, um, well, actually the other day I was reading about um, Stephen Hawking. And oh, Stephen Hawking. Yeah, one of his quotes says that um, the universe and the cosmic order, everything is not perfect. Right. And he was talking about how the universe is not perfect. It's chaos. Yeah. yeah. Now I was thinking about it, and I was listening to Avery Denning, who was saying that uh, everything in the universe, everything is put in sequential order, and it's perfect. So I was thinking about that. We about well, Avery's still alive and Stephen Hawking just died, so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were talking about that. There yeah. were some medicine men that were talking about that the other night. Um, and we were discussing that and you know, prophecies. So how'd you do? Is, is the world uh, it was in perfect Interesting. Uh, 
some people say that it was in perfect order, but it has been made imperfect. Yeah. Probably by the boarding schools. Though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the long walk. It seems to be real important. Like uh, global warming, that's man, man caused. Or Not according to Trump. Yeah. <laughs> So he says that they well, they say that it was an <laughs> cause right to make it not the yeah like pollution yeah what did they what did I just read they've got uh, the glaciers in Canada are are disappearing faster than they predicted and and now they're scared because well you know all that water it used to be frozen. And now all that water is going to leak somewhere into the oceans, and all the oceans are going to rise because all the glaciers are disappearing. We're losing the uh, in Antarctica and Ar the Arctic. We are losing all of the ice, and all that stuff is. I mean, it's it's ice now, but it, it'll be water in the future, and the oceans are going to rise. We're going to lose Fort Lauderdale, Florida. What a tragedy! Mar-a-Lago Mar will go away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. It's distressing me that President Trump is going to lose his. his he um, just recently he's um, talking about something about the environment, um, or dismissing that. Um, I don't know if it was a uh, something to do with the environment, right? And he's doing away with that. Yeah. That. Yeah. If we if we uh, if we acknowledge it, then we have to spend money on it, and he doesn't want to spend any money on this stuff, on the environment, on the EPA, on all of these organizations that potentially could fight global warming. Uh, he doesn't want to uh, control the amount of emissions uh, from, from industry, because he's trying to increase industry, uh, and, and if, he, if he controls emissions, then that will decrease the amount that we can manufacture in the United States. That's why he's doing all these things. That's why he claims that global warming doesn't exist. However, <laughs> and it goes against not only your philosophy, but it also goes against a lot of different philosophies, against Christianity and Judaism and uh, Muslim, uh, the Muslim faith. Uh, so it goes against a lot of different things, a lot of different ideas. <sighs> So this does exist, it obviously exists on this reservation, it exists in your philosophy, it exists in a lot of uh, native philosophies, almost all of them as a matter of fact. Talk about uh, being stewards of the, of, the, uh, of the environment. And that's all we're going to say about that. Okay, so let's talk about cities for, for a minute. This is the German sociologist Ferdinand Tonis. Uh, he argued that there are two ways that people can relate to each other in a group. Uh, one of them is Gemeinschaft, which means uh, community relationships, and the other is Gesellschaft, which means individual relationships. Gemeinschaft is, uh, uh, binds people together. It's the social glue that keeps people together. Gesellschaft, on the other hand, is uh, a weak binding between people. Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. So G Gemeinschaft is a strong uh, bond between people, and it, uh, it makes people do what they're supposed to do. So the reality is that if we talk about the Navajo Nation, and we, not, we talk about your, your philosophy and your principles, uh, we would have to talk about Gemeinschaft, because you guys do what it, you're supposed to do without anybody forcing you to do it. I mean, if we, if we relied on the Navajo Police Department the Navajo Nation Police Department. There aren't that. There aren't enough of them. They're just never around when you need them, right? So people have to do what what is right because it is right, and that is known as Gemeinschaft. On the other hand, we have Gesellschaft. Gesellschaft is a weak bond between uh, society and the individual. Gemeinschaft groups are characteristic of small folk groups, uh, organizations. And within these groups, interpersonal relationships play an especially important role. The reason you do things is you talk about your plans. You do things uh, because that, that's what your grandmother, that's what your grandparents uh, have told you to do. Uh, these, are the, you, these are your traditions. And these bind you together. 
And sometimes the, uh, what your grandparents told you and what somebody else's grandparents told them is not exactly the same. But then you have a conversation about it and you decide uh, how you're going to resolve this conflict between the two, between the two uh, uh, ideas. People feel connected to one another because they feel a unity of spirit. And of course, um, and I keep asking you guys this question in, uh, in not only in this class, but also in uh, introduction to, to uh, counseling, I ask you uh, about uh, your ethnicity and how you, how you feel and whether you feel connected to your group and uh, to an individual. Uh, you all say that you, are, you identify yourselves as Navajo and that is the most important thing to you. The relationships are central to the individual's identity. So your relationship to your tribe, to uh, your uh, relatives is so important that that becomes the most important thing to you. Obligations are associated uh, with one's gemeinschaft to uh, carry weight of full moral obligations. And of course, we talk about taboos and whatnot. Uh, so we, uh, you, you are controlled by your, uh, the bond you have uh, with, your, with your society. Gesellschaft are groups that are characteristic of modern Western societies and they treat relationships as imaginary, instrumental, uh, as a means to an end. Uh, Gesellschaft groups are perceived as relatively impersonal and somewhat contractual, which leads to the necessity of justice obligations to govern disputes between individuals. And this is the reason why in the United States we have so many lawyers and we have so many courts and we have so many judges. We need them because people argue all the time. Why? Because in the United States we have a Gesellschaft. We have a very weak bond between people. Uh, it's, we have an immigrant population in the United States. We have people that are Catholics, we have people that are Protestants, we have people that are Mormons, we have people that are Seventh-day Adventists, we have people that are Hindus, we have people that are Muslims, we have people that are just every little thing uh, uh, under the sun. And because of that, we have people that are come from Germany, we have people that originally came from Germany, from England, from from uh, from Scandinavia, from every place, from Scotland, the Scots hate the, the Irish, hate the uh, English, the English hate the Irish, uh, the Scots uh, hate the English, the English hate the Scots. We have we have all these people that don't like each other, and for that reason, if somebody does one thing, then the other person's going to argue with them. So we get a lot of arguments, and that's why we need a we need so many judges and we need so many lawyers. We have Polish people, we have Armenians, we have Turks. Turks and, and Armenians don't like each other. Because during World War I, the Turks uh, massacred uh, over a million uh, Armenians for one reason or another. If you ask the Armenians, it was for one reason. If you ask the Turks, it was for another reason. <laughs> but we don't even talk about it because of the uh, the antipathy between the Turks and the, and the uh, Armenians. In Gesellschaft groups, uh, individuals can't be expected always to behave in pro-social ways toward others because they have strong obligations toward them. So formalized rules are necessary to keep people in line and that's why we have so many laws. The speed limit between here and Gallup is 55 miles an hour and nobody, including me, I don't drive 55 miles an hour either, but I've increased my speed to 70. <laughs> and I'll be going to Gallup this weekend, <laughs> so get out of my way. No, actually, I get past going 70 miles an hour. What, you don't it's probably get 70? Travis. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've been passed by you. Of course, you went by so fast, I couldn't, I couldn't see in your car. So. No, I get past, and I've got that little red car. I mean, it looks fast, but I only drive at 70 miles an hour. I have that hasn't happened here yet. Not yet. But, uh, uh, when it does, then I'll start driving the other car. I guess. Or a roadkill. <laughs> That's dangerous. Last year I was driving home. Was it last year that it snowed just before in May? No, it was two years ago. It, it snowed in May, and uh, there were people coming out of their driveways and dropping big globs of mud. Well, that would have been okay in the other car, but I was in the little red car. 
and I ran over one of those globs of mud, and the thing came up. I thought I, I thought I took out the whole bottom of my car. I mean, it was just a big glob of mud that had come off this guy's tire. But you know what I did? I just kept going, and I was thinking, well, if I broke my car, it'll, it'll break down, and, and it'll stop, right? Well, that's not. I kept going. That's the kind of person I am. Instead of stopping and inspecting and finding out if everything was okay. Anyway. You could be stranded somewhere. <laughs> could have been stranded someplace. But see, I've got uh, roadside service. If you don't get, if you get signal. <laughs> oh, that's a possibility too. Yeah. I got a telephone. I think it works. I charge it every once in a while. I got a little bit of charge. See, I got a little bit. <laughs> I'll probably if I be need a plan tonight. B, if you go somewhere. <laughs> uh, and I usually remember it. Sometimes I forget it. I forgot it the other day. Forget it. Forgot my, <coughs> my phone yesterday. I didn't have a phone. What if my wife tried to call me? <laughs> she knows I forget my phone. She knows I forget charge my phone. She knows. <coughs> I get all kinds of problems. I ah. never, you know, check real quick. I never thought that um, a couple would have to, you know, communicate like often. And they see my brother and his wife, they're like, because their phones got shut off. Oh. I was like, oh, okay, I'm sure you guys can, you know. Just talk to each other. You guys, um, I'm pretty sure you guys can last while my brother's at work and you're here. Because they're like, they text each other like constantly. I can't even get a text message. I don't even know so what a text message is. the craziest message. thing my brother did was he charged up the, the walkie-talkies overnight, and he took one, and he kept one. I was like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Why do you need that much communication with anybody? I get tired of it. <laughs> in, the, in the old days, phones were attached to the wall. <laughs> and you had to be next to the wall in order to get a telephone call. So, I mean, people didn't stand beside the wall waiting for a telephone call. <laughs> telephone call. We had to do stuff, I think. The rotary thing? Yeah. Oh, don't make fun of the rotary telephone. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the old days, or the push button telephone. See, we used to have a push button telephone. I grew up on a rotary. On a rotary phone? Yeah. Uh, I, now I know this is going to scare you, but uh, in Fort Belknap, here I'm going to talk about another reservation. They didn't have telephones until 1972. And these are telephones attached to the wall. There were three telephones on the reservation. There was one in Hayes, there was one in Lodgepole, and there was one at the Agents. And those are the only three telephones on the reservation. This is in 1972. They didn't have cell phone service there until the 1990s. Yeah, don't get scared. So these people couldn't even t talk to each other. The people from one end of the reservation would never have anything to do with the people at the other end of the reservation because there was no way to communicate for the longest time. Of course, the people at one end were one tribe, and the people at the other end were one tribe. So they're now strange, isn't it? They'd meet halfway in between and get married, I guess. <clears throat> Uh, people of the world over feel a moral obligation uh, to their community. There you go. Uh, objective obligations. Uh, people believe that they have an obligation to act in a certain way, even if there is no official rule or law that requires them to do so. And, of course, you have your taboos and you have your obligations. Um, once upon a time, there, used, there was a powwow here on the, at the college. And then they stopped it because they... they determined that it was not traditional to have it, for Navajos to powwow. I, that's what they determined. That's why you don't have one anymore. Really? I know, it was a strange argument. And I was going, huh? Really? You guys don't powwow? Come on. I know, it's my favorite thing about being on the reservation. Uh, legitimately regulated, uh, people should be prevented from engaging in a moral violation, or they should be punished if they ha they act in a such in such a way. Uh, if they uh, 
violate some um, moral code, such as uh, adultery. Is adultery a bad thing, or is it a good thing, or is it is that a, is that something that was brought here by the by Western uh, Europeans, or is adultery a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> More, is it a moral violation, I guess? That's the question we should ask. What if somebody wanders around without their clothes on? Is that, is that a moral violation also? Okay. I was just wondering. Has anybody ever been to a strip joint? Neither have I. Damn it, my wife, you've been to a strip joint? No. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's been to strip joints. I mean, like, the, her whole Air Force career was spin at the strip joint. I don't, never could figure that one out. And I've never been to one. I walked onto a, a nude beach pipe and then it was real like, <laughs> walked on. This wasn't, this wasn't um, in Europe somewhere. <laughs> we all went out there and... Did they, they knew, but you didn't know? No. Oh, they didn't know either. Okay. There's actually a... I, it was... It took a while for me to look around and see where I was at. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, every Thursday night is new swimming at the Svinbad in Germany. So if you ever go to Germany, don't go to the Svinbad on, on Thursday night. Heated pools. Really nice. Nude bathing. You don't have to. You can put, put a swimming suit on if you want. I had a friend that was a very, very religious guy, and uh, he was uh, trying to lose weight, so he was swimming. <laughs> he was swimming, and he didn't know. He's not that bright, but uh, so he, <laughs> he went to the swim bottle Thursday night, and he got shocked out of his, out of his mind. He's, he was such a Christian guy, he was trying to scrub his eyeballs because he saw <laughs> naked women. It was, I thought it was funny. He, he wore glasses that were this thick, and he's got these glasses on, and he walks out of the, uh, the, the male locker room where it's relatively cold. The Germans hardly heat anything. So he walks out of the, out of the, the, uh, the uh, uh, male uh, <laughs> dressing area, and he walks into the swimming pool, and his, and his glasses fog up, and he's walking around, <laughs> and he can't see anything. He takes off his glasses, and he cleans them off. He puts them on. All of a sudden, there's a woman without any clothes standing right in front of him. He wondered what was going on. <laughs> he told it much better. <laughs> Ethics of divinity involves the moral code respecting the sanctity of the natural order of things as dictated by a transcendent moral authority. And of course, we talked about that moral authority. Who is this guy? that uh, is our moral authority. Immoral actions are perceived to violate the natural order of things. <sighs> Hunter, uh, in 1991, proposed that a culture war exists in the United States and that the battle lines are drawn between those who have an impulse toward orthodoxy and those who have an impulse toward progressivism. And we're seeing this in this election. We're seeing individuals that are far to the right, we have, we're seeing individuals that are far to the left, and these individuals are fighting with, well, not fighting with what? But they kind of are, because he sent the bombs to all those Democrats, right? Uh, so he's trying to, to, to kill them, uh, but the reality is we're in a cultural war in the United States, and if you watch, watch Fox News, you get one side of the cultural war, if you watch MSNBC or CNN, you get the other side of the cultural war. And if you read the, uh, the uh, news lines uh, from CNN, you get one thing. If you read uh, the same uh, news lines from Fox News, you get a totally different idea what, about what's going on in the United States. So we have this strange cultural war going on. And it's happening right here in Arizona with McShirley and Cinema. The two individuals are, are diametrically opposed to one another. It's a cultural war. <clears throat> and there are some people that no matter what Trump does, it's correct. And other individuals, no matter what Trump does, it's incorrect. But unfortunately, yesterday, 
Donald Trump sent out a video. It's a uh, video against immigration and immigrants. He's been, he's been talking about this for two years, about how bad these people are and how we need to build the wall. Remember he wants to build the wall? Well, this is a, uh, this is a video uh, dealing with how bad these people really are. And of course, he shows uh, people storming the uh, the gates and trying to break into the United States. But they're not really <laughs> trying to break into the United States. They're really trying to break into Mexico. These are people from South America. But that's not important. Yes, it is. It's very important because it looks kind of racist. He's making people of uh, people who are Hispanic look like criminals, like bad people. Well, they mixed natives up with, with, with Hispanics. But the reality is there were Hispanics here before there were Englishmen or before there were Frenchmen, before there were Germans, there were, there were Spanish people, especially in this port portion of the United States. Because Mexico used to control this area, and they're Hispanic. So some of the people that have been here longer than all those crazy white people with the, their guns and their AR-15s, uh, they've been here longer. And here he's trying to make, make it look like that. they're bad people. So who are these people that are coming up? This, this infamous caravan with 7,000 people in it. Who are these people? And where are they coming from? And is it important? Or do we need to just keep everybody out? Who are they? Any ideas? Is that important? Or should we just keep everybody up? Should we cut off immigration right now and not let anybody else in? Nobody else gets to come in. You guys can kick out anybody that you want to. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> when did uh, Trump's family immigrate to the United States? Three generations. Yeah, three generations ago. At the end of the uh, 19th century. So his family's been here for, I don't know, about 125 years. It's not very long, not really. But who are the people in the caravan that we're, we're so scared, scared of? Who are these people? Most of them are from uh, El Salvador and Honduras. And of course, there's a lot of um, uh, violence going on, gang violence going on in El Salvador and uh, Honduras. Uh, the government isn't doing a very good job of keeping the gangs from uh, from raping and murdering people. So they're fleeing the violence in their own countries and they're coming, they're coming to the United States. Or some of them aren't going to make it this far. Uh, a lot of them will, will stop in Mexico. Would you rather be in the United States or would you rather be someplace where they actually spoke the language that you speak? So a lot of them will stop in Mexico. But anyway, and I hope you never see the, the, the video. It's, it's kind of a Kind of a negative thing. Anyway, so we've got this uh, we've got this culture war going on in the United States. We have people that are progressive. We have people that are very orthodox. And of course, the people that are very orthodox are the the uh, people on the right wing, and the people that are more progressive are, are on the left wing. And you'll see these advertisements. Religious adherents who are orthodox are committed to the idea of a transcendent authority. This authority is viewed to have existed long before humans and is operating independently of people. Uh, this authority is believed to be more knowledgeable and more powerful than all of, the, uh, all of human experience. And that is the orthodox way of looking at the culture. In the orthodox view, this transcendent authority created a moral code and revealed it to the human beings in sacred texts. Now this sounds a lot like your own orthodoxy, doesn't it? Your own traditionalism. Doesn't this sound like the same thing? Or am I misinterpreting some of the things that people have told me? So don't you have a moral authority that transcends humanity? Like don't the holy people, aren't, weren't they here before humans were here? And aren't you supposed to pray to the, the, those people that came before you? Uh, the moral code is perceived to stand across all times and circumstances and should not be allowed to uh, be altered or uh, to accommodate 
any social changes or individual differences. Individuals in society are expected to adapt themselves to this ordained moral code, and that's pretty much the way your orthodoxy is concerned, your traditionalism is concerned. We don't change, you don't change your traditions, uh, you change yourself to adapt to those traditions. Isn't that the way it works? Pretty much. I don't know where cell phones fit in, or video games, but we'll figure that out later. Adherents of progressive religions uh, emphasize the importance of a human agency in understanding and formulating a moral code. Progressivists reject the view that a transcendent authority reveals itself and its will to humans. They believe that humans play an integral role in the formulation of moral codes. So as far as they're concerned, these moral codes can change. They can change with the changes in society. <clears throat> Those are the more progressive religions. But there are more traditional religions. Islam is a very traditional religion. But not everybody uh, who practices Islam practices the traditional religion. Some are practicing a more progressive religion. The Sufis, for example. Uh, the two major uh, branches of, uh, uh, of Muslimism are uh, the Shias and the, Shi the Sunnis and the Shiites. And we, of course, we saw this as we fought the people in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, well, we didn't see it in Afghanistan because they were all Sunni. But uh, in Iraq, uh, half the uh, battle had to do with the Shia and the Sunni attacking one another. And, of course, we were stuck in the middle, which was a real ugly situation. Uh, but there's a, there are other groups out there that are more progressive. The, Su the, uh, the uh, uh, Sufis, for example, they believe in mysticism. They don't believe in killing people, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, there are branches of uh, Christianity. There's a reason why Christianity has fra or Protestantism has fragmented into so many denominations. It's because people come up with new ideas and then they create a church, and then that church becomes a splinter of, of uh, the uh, uh, Protestantism. We can take Protest Protestantism, Luther, the Lutheran Church is the first Protestant religion. Uh, the Episcopalian Church is the, was one of the second ones. Uh, but if we look at, uh, at the history of Protestantism, uh, the uh, Amish were one of the first <coughs> Protestant groups. So all the splinter, all the Anabaptists, all the splinters of the, uh, of the uh, Protestant faith uh, that were Anabaptists, like the Mennonites and the, and the Computerites, uh, all of these individuals are far more traditional. Uh, individuals who are Amish can only marry within their own religion. They can't bring anybody in from outside. It's the same way with the Huterites. It's the same way with the Mennonites. They're not supposed to bring in people from outside. You can't convert to be Amish. You can't convert to be a Huterite. You can't convert to be a Mennonite. It doesn't work that way. They're not looking for converts. <clears throat> as confusing as all that is. Okay, I don't know why I'm talking about Huterites and Mennonites. <laughs> I'm sure it's important. <laughs> Progressivists believe that because uh, social... Um, uh, Mormonism. Uh, if you understand how Mormons, ex uh, 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 how they came to be. The Mormon church didn't start until the 1830s. That's when Joseph Smith uh, wrote the Book of Mormon, way back in the 1830s. Well, that wasn't very long ago. By that time, uh, by that time we, had, uh, we had the Episcopalians, we had uh, Lutherans, we had Seventh-day Adventists, we had everybody except the Jehovah's Witnesses, which started at the end of the... Uh, uh, 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So we have all these new splinter groups. Jehovah's Witnesses are, are, are brand new as far as re the uh, religions are concerned. The Mormon Church is relatively new. It's only been around for about a, 175 years. Uh, but all these other religions, the Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church is, is like 500 years old. Uh, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, all of these other denominations are really, really relatively old. Compared to the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church, of course, is 2,000 years old or so. No, nah, it's not 2,000 years old. How old is it? It's, it's 1,950 years old, I guess. Kind of. Kind of. 
Uh, churches are so fascinating. Watching, watching how religion has splintered over and over and over again. Uh, it's just fascinating to watch. Because the church started as just one church, and then it, split, it splintered into the Orthodox Church and the, and the Catholic Church. And then eventually the Catholic Church splintered into the Protestant Church. Protestant church. Yeah. It's, it's interesting about the, the Paris Le Rue, the, the, the museum. Uh -huh. It has like a, like a, the most painting that was most popular I've seen like the whole room was probably like John the Baptist. The beheading of John the Baptist. You see everywhere you're talking about how this whole building can probably fill up paintings of John the Baptist. On the platter, it's cut. Anything is bizarre, isn't it? In the old days, uh, and if you go to old cathedrals, a lot of a lot of the pictures that you see are fairly gorgeous and they're kind of sexy. You're going, wow, this is like, you know, like going through, like looking at a Playboy magazine. This is kind of cool. All these naked women, all this gory stuff going on. It's like watching, I don't know, Halloween or Scream or something. It's really kind of bizarre, but the old the old cathedrals, and I'm talking about the old cathedrals. We don't have old cathedrals in the United States. But when I was down in uh, South America, I went to <laughs> I went to a cathedral. I always show you some of the pictures. They were just a little, and I'm taking pictures of going, whoa, wow. I mean, people used to come and look at this stuff, <clears throat> and a lot of it had to do with beheading of John the Baptist or whatever, or you know, crucifying somebody. And of course. The old pictures of Jesus, he was almost naked. It's pretty close, pretty pretty darn close. <coughs> but there's a lot of naked people, and the cherubs, of course, don't have any clothes on. It's really kind of odd. <clears throat> so you see it in different a different light. Progressivists believe that because social circumstances change, the moral code must change along with it. The interesting thing uh, with uh, the Catholic Church in the United States is we don't see these kinds of things in, in Catholic churches in the United States. But if you go to Europe, if you go to, to South America, where the, the cathedrals are much older and the paintings are a lot I older. Think, like, you can even like, uh, you can even witness that you can go downstairs on the first second floor, uh -huh. and look inside that one thing, there's like pain that starts from here. And you can see where religion takes over alongside. And, and, and all of a sudden they start putting on clothes. Yeah. That's bizarre, as that is. Um, the uh, statue of David in, uh, in Rome, uh, he's standing there without any clothes on. And at one point, they put a fig leaf over his, his uh, penis and his scrotum in order to, so, so people would be looking at him like he was naked. But that was Michelangelo in the, in the 15th century, sculpted that. So we know that, or, or we can see, we can look at the art and we can see that things have changed over time. And of course, part of it has to do with gore, goriness and part of it has to do with, with nudity. 2007, Haight and Graham expanded Schwader's three moral ethics, expanding it to five. Uh, the first moral ethic was to avoid harm. Let me check on time. Oh, my. Uh, avoid harm. To, uh, the second was protect fairness. Uh, third was be loyal to your in-group. Uh, the fourth one was respect hierarchy. And the, fourth, the fifth one was achieve purity. Wow. There you, there you go. There's moral ethics for you. Uh, and this is, uh, these, guys are, these guys are Canadians. And here they are. They're arguing with uh, the guy from Yale, and they're arguing with the guy from Harvard. And these, these are guys up in Canada. And they came up with these five. Um, this guy kind of dropped out of the scene, but this this is uh, hate, and hate has uh, has followed up on, on all of his uh, his cultural wars and his morality or his concept of morality. Uh, the first is avoid harm. People are sensitive to any behaviors that cause harm to others, um, and of course that's the argument that the, that cultural war has to do with the argument between uh, the uh, the uh, pro life and the uh, pro-choice uh, movements in the United States. Uh, protect fairness, uh, they attend closely to whether resources or rights are distributed in a fair way. And of course, we look at that a lot in the United States. Uh, some people don't believe in welfare. They don't believe in, in food stamps. Uh, they think that everybody sh has, should uh, be on a level playing field and that we should all make the same amount of money. No, that's not right. We should, uh, we should all work and we should all 
provide for our own, our own families. Now what's the problem with that? Why isn't everybody equal in the United States? Why am I teaching this class instead of somebody who's a Navajo? Where are those Navajos, those PhD Navajos that teach psychology? Where are they? Where the hell are they? Doing ceremonies. <laughs> Why am I teaching this class? Why am I making all this money from the Navajo Nation? Why, why isn't there a Navajo teaching this class? They're not qualified. Why aren't they qualified? Because they don't have a Western education. <laughs> they don't have a Western education. Um, okay, that, that's very logical. I, I, I can agree with that. Um, so why not? Too busy. What? Doing, Doing what? ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> because Western way of thought is not like... Why don't you just start your own college? Oh, you wait a minute, you already did this one? Hey, well, you already did it. Okay. Um, so why... Why am I here? Babysitting. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like you guys a lot too. Need a job. <laughs> I need a job. Okay, there we go. I, I need to work. Uh, why? Why am I doing this? Job? Why? Why? Why aren't there any other? I mean, there's other tribes. You know, there are other Indians. They don't. They don't. I mean, you guys are in ceremony all the time, but the other tribes don't have that much to do. Not like you guys have so much. I mean, their ceremonies only take like you know, an hour, hour and a half. Your, your ceremonies take days. Yeah. Exactly. And money. Oh, man. So, so you can inspire some students to take your job. No, I want you to take my job. I can't be here forever. This is this class. She's so pregnant. I don't think she can. He's screaming down the street. Too. Why am I here? Why aren't you? Why isn't there a Navajo here teaching teaching this class? I say the Navajo got a better offer somewhere, and we got you really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> you did get me really cheap, but that's not. Why are you? I'm here because uh, I'm white, and white people have had an advantage over all other groups in the United States educationally. I'm the first. I'm the first male in my family to ever get a college degree. However, there are a lot of white people that have had college degrees, PhDs, for two, three hundred years in their families. Well, where are all the black people with PhDs? Well, they didn't start getting. They weren't even be able to be educated until after the Civil War. And here I've got a family that's not my family, but other families. Had, had PhDs, had been teaching in college for three, four hundred years. So it's the fact that I'm white that, that gives me an advantage. And it's the fact that, that uh, as Navajos you've been disadvantaged. And the reason this college is so important is because now it's going to allow you to be educated at the same level as me, potentially. And somebody so, should take my job. I'm, that's why I'm here, is to <laughs> educate you guys to take my job. And that's okay. I want to lose my job. It's fine. I don't need my job. I have a rich wife. I don't need my job. You say that on camera. <laughs> I did. I say that on camera. Right. Great. They'll probably watch this and fire me off my ass. Or stop paying me money or something. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so I just volunteer your hours now. That's what they're gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> so there is no fairness. There, there is no. There is no fairness. If you're white, you're advantaged, and if you're not white, if you're a minority, then you're disadvantaged. And so there is no level playing field. We can pretend there is, but there hasn't been a level playing field ever. But the more educated you guys get, the more you vote the more likely that people will listen to what you have to say. And then, of course, the, eventually, there will be an even, even 
play an equal playing field and you guys will be just as advantaged as I am hopefully that's what we're working toward anyway and that's why we're here